Thanks, Lee. Appreciate it. Even though that blessed assurance just went, was gone, wasn't it? Shannon was trying to help a little bit. She was giving a little, little tune over there. Um, Rock of Ages, good, strong, good, strong hymn. And uh, we uh, are going to not quite begin chapter 2 of uh, 1 Peter. We ended this morning, chapter 1, so I want to give a little bit of an introduction in uh, chapter 2 uh, before we actually get into all that is all that is there. So if you have your Bible, if you open up, or if you don't have one, there's one in the pew that you can grab a hold of and open up with me to the Word. Trials and tribulations. Is anybody tired of trials? <laughs> tribulations. <laughs> what did you say, Wyatt? Say it. What did you say? Carol, plug your ears. Carol, plug your ears. <laughs> That's only when we talk about trials connected with joy, right? She's laughing. She's laughing. Um, Trials and tribulations. That's what we've been talking about. I think we're going to continue as we move through the book of Peter to talk about all of those trials and those tribulations, getting us more information about them, things to help us to be able to move through them. Who was? Who, I want you to raise your hand if it was the first time that you really understood that in our trials, God wants to use our trials to grow us closer to Him. Was that the first time anybody else had heard that? God wants to take us through trials so we can grow closer to Him. Because most of us have looked at trials and we don't want them. We don't like them. We don't understand why they're coming in our life. But they're coming so that we can grow closer to the Lord. And trials plus assurance again brings what word? Three letter word. Joy. Trials Plus the Word of God brings what? Joy. Holiness. Holiness. In the holiness, is that what Josh has told us before? Growing in the Lord. Maturing in the Lord. Without the Word, it doesn't happen, does it? We need the Word to be able to do that. And we spend a whole lot of time in the Haggius. And I hope that you've learned quite a few things that we can do while we're in the haggiest with the Lord. Things that we are to consider about our lives. Now as we move on uh, to chapter 2, we are going to see Peter continues to address trials in our lives. But what he's going to show us here is that trials are going to help us live a life that is separate. A separated life. Separated from what? The world. The Bible says we are in the world, but we're what? We're not of the world. So he's going to help us to understand some of those things in our trials. And I would like, as we've, uh, uh, just to pass through chapter 1, one more time together, I want to read it in its entirety, and then come to chapter 2 and give you the introduction. So I want you to, as we go through, just reminisce a little bit about some of the things that you've learned as we read through it together. Chapter 1 and verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. 
And I don't know if you recall, when we were coming through this section of Scripture right here, Julie Minor came to know this, Jesus Christ as her Savior. So we could say, why did we go through 1 Peter? Why have we spent so much time in 1 Peter? There's some fruit that has come from 1 Peter, hasn't there? Some people have come and placed their faith in the Lord. Not only did Julie, but McKenna did. And also, we had, uh, I think we were outside of 1 Peter though, when uh, Liz came to know the Lord too, here on Easter Sunday. So, as we've gone through it, the Lord has put forth that word, and there's people that are getting saved. Where in verse 6, you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness to manifold temptations or trials, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than the gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found under the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though you now see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. I hope you remember a picture that I gave you, the angels desiring to look into those things. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober. That was the second half that we started, wasn't it? Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. That was the being drawn aside into the Haggius, wasn't that we talked about? But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Hope you remember that word fear. Reverence. And gives us a little deeper of a relationship, doesn't it, that we have. We have. The church has, too. The, the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ, that fear word. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the spirit and the unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever for all flesh as is grass. And all the glory of man as the flower of grass, the grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. A whole bunch there, isn't there? A whole bunch. But as we move on to chapter 2, considering all those things that the Lord has taken us through here, he's going to talk about this separated life. Being separated from the world. And in our trials are to do that in our lives. They're to take us and separate us from, as we looked at before, those former lusts or those former things that we like. But to be separated unto Him. But there are a couple false views when we start talking about separation that are there. If you look at our church constitution, our doctrinal statement and all those things, there is a little section that says, talks about separation 
what it means to be separated from the world. Satan wants us to be conformed to what? The world, doesn't he? He wants us to be... And if he can't bring the world in here, he's going to try and get us outside the walls of the church into the world. And I gave you two words a while ago that he does that through. The ecumenical movement. And there's one other movement called what? Does anybody remember that? It starts with an E2. It's a some type of a church. What? Not element. Emergent church. So the emergent church and the ecumenical movement. Ecumenical movement tries to get us out. The emergent church tries to bring the world in. Yeah. So he's going to call us to a place in our trials of being separated from the world. But there's a couple views out there that are false views. And I want to go over what they are and then go over for just a minute what the real view is that we are going to be looking at in this next chapter. And the first one is this. There are a group of people that believe that man is okay. That man is not depraved. Man is not a sinner. But man just needs a little reformation. We need to, that means that you can take who you are, the old man, that person that you are, and you can reform that person, and you can make them think right, you can make them talk right, you can make them behave right, you can do all those things for these people and make them right. And then we can say, that they've moved out of that place in their life and they're separating themselves from who they used to be. We can take uh, our kids and behavior. Can we, can we, with our kids, can we spank our kids and bring them into compliance? We can't. You, you can actually. You, you can put some fear of spanking in your kids and we can... We can, make them, we can make them obey. We can make them do what they need to do. If they don't, what do we do? We spank their bottom. And they're going to start obeying, aren't they? But what have we never worked on? The heart. Where does the real change happen? In the heart. So this view is that view that, that we can use these outward circumstances. We can do all these things to reform people. And we can make them better. We can make people better. You know, those views are out there. And I, I'm going to hit, I, I don't, I, I got to talk, I got to, I got to mention it here. They really believe that human nature is okay. That our human nature is okay. Just like I said before, we need to be reformed a little bit. And I don't like this word. I don't like this word. And I'm going to use it. It's called self what? Self will. Something else. Somebody else help me. Self. Self worth. Self esteem. Self worth. Because that feeds into what I'm talking about right here. You can feel good about who? <clears throat> Yourself. Right? You can, feel, you can still be a sinner. Right? You can still do all these things. Your nature's corrupt. But you can still feel good about yourself. We're trying to reform that old nature and for you to feel good about yourself. I'm sorry. I had to come to a point where I just couldn't feel good about this old person. There was a whole lot of, there was a whole lot of terribleness there that needed to be fixed. And I couldn't self-reform it. I tried. I was trying to reform it. To self-reform that old place. That old man that's in me. The old man or the old woman that's in each one of us. You know, it also, with this, you want to, people want to reform the intellect. You know, if we can get smarter, if we can be more educated, guess what? It's going to reform that nature. And it, if that doesn't work, we can do some moral teaching, can't we? We can teach people morals, and if they come underneath these morals and then they start living a moral life, do you know a lot of people that live a moral life that don't know Jesus? They're trying to 
reform themselves. What we read, the article that we read this morning in Sunday school, was that self-reformation? That was self-reformation, wasn't it? I, I want to obey the commandments. I want to keep the commandments. And I want to sometimes uh, repent of some of the things that I've done. But then what I want to go back to, I want to work harder at what? Keeping the commandments so that I can have the gift of belief in Jesus Christ. That's self-reformation. Self-reformation isn't it, is it? Self-reformation will not work. It will help for maybe a time. can help for a time. Do you know where this is really being brought out? It's really being brought out in our society through psychology. Psychology is self-reformation. Now, can we learn some things from psychology? Can we learn some things that they've learned for behavior and all those types of things? We can, but will psychology is talking about self-reformation. They're trying to reform you to think right, to do things that are right. But a lot of times, that's why it's so important if you're going to a psychologist or a somebody like that they are a Christian psychologist. Because what are they going to use? They're going to use the Bible. They're going to be able to work on the true reason why you're there. But they're also going to be, used, be able to use some psychology things that they've learned through behavior to help. So they, they both have to be together. If you have just a psychologist that does not use the Bible, what's he trying to do? He wants to self-reform you. He wants to try and self-reform you. He does. Because there, there is only one way. There's only one way to truly be reformed and truly be changed. That's where it starts. With who? Jesus Christ. A psychologist, Christian psychologist, should always begin his lesson, his first, his first, his first thing. What's he going to evaluate first of all in somebody's life? Where your belief is. Where your belief is. Because truly to be able to get him to where he needs to get them, he's got to deal with the sin nature of man. The corrupt nature. He's not going to be able, through all his things, to self-reform. Can it help for a while? Can we give some techniques and some of those things to help? But it's not ever going to solve the problem. It's going to be a self-reformation. That's the one extreme. When we start looking at separation... The second one is this. The second one is when we come to salvation and belief in the Lord, what immediately comes in our life? Holy Spirit. So the other side of self-reformation is some people say the old, the, the old man, the old nature can be reformed. It can be made better. It can be made better. And it can be made better. And it can be made better. And that just is not true. You can't do that. Well, the other side, the other extreme then is those that are Christians that, like we do, believe that the Holy Spirit comes into our life when you get saved, but now guess what you don't have to do? I don't have to do anything because the Holy Spirit's going to do what? He's going to do, do everything. So the Holy Spirit's going to do everything in my life so, therefore, I don't have to do anything. The Holy Spirit is going to reform me. The Holy Spirit is going to be doing everything in my life. Therefore, I don't need a teacher of the Word. I don't even need to read the Word because the Holy Spirit's there. He's going to make all the changes that He needs to do in my life. That's an extreme, isn't it? Because what we looked at before, not very long before this, last week, being born again, being born of Water and the what? And the Spirit. And they work together, don't they? How is the Spirit going to grow in our life? Through the Word, right? So the other extreme is, when you get saved, you've got the Holy Spirit, and that's all you need, and He's going to do all the reformation in your life, and He's going to make you everything that you need to be outside 
the Word of God. Do you know what happens with that extreme on that side? Free will takes over. <laughs> free, will, free will takes over. Free will takes over. Though, and and it, those folks are folks that we see all around us. So you know, they, they're Christians, I believe, without a doubt. They've come to the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in their life, but they don't grow. They don't grow. Where does growth come through? The Word, right? The, the Word of God. That's, that's the water. That's where growth comes. So aside from the Word, we're working in conjunction with the Holy Spirit. There's not going to be any growth you know, that's the extreme on the other side. And those folks never grow in their faith, in the trust of the Lord. The word says, I think it's in Romans 10. What builds our faith? Romans 10, verse, it might be verse 19 or 15 or someone, somewhere in there. See if somebody can find it. There's something that... Helps with our faith. See if anybody finds it. Okay. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the what? By the word of God. So all the growth comes by the word of God in our lives. That's the other extreme. Do you see the two extremes? People are trying to be sep separating their lives, separating, making ourselves to be a better person through... Self-reformation, and then through the Holy Spirit's going to do everything. There's nothing that you can do in your life, but He's going to do all of it. Which, some of it is right. We have the, a new nature given to us. We've got the Holy Spirit, but He doesn't act what? I mean, He can act alone, but He acts in conjunction with God's Word for us to grow and for Him to be everything that we need to be. You want the Holy Spirit? You want the power of the Holy Spirit in your life? You're going to get it when we begin to read the Word and we begin to study the Word and we begin to get close to the Lord. Do we got power? Yes, the Holy Spirit will be energized and there will be power in your life, in my life, but not apart from the Word of God. And I'm Elaine. And it's a good illustration. That's a, and that's what we do in our life. When we get saved, we put the Holy Spirit in the coat closet. And we lock Him down in there. And we say, I'm only giving you... And that's really only salvation. I, I only... I only... I've gotten saved. Now you're in the coat closet. I'm not giving you every area of my life. I'm just not going to do it. So, and that's what Shelley's been talking about with the ladies. Is being able to... Being full of the Holy Spirit is allowing Him to have every area of our life. That's really what being full of the Holy Spirit really means. And how does it come? What's going to help? Through the Word of God. Through the Word of God, you're going to give over more of your life, more of your heart to Him, aren't you? More of who you are in the Spirit is going to fill us like it wants to fill us. It indwells us. There's a difference, isn't there? You, you probably learned about the indwelling and the filling of the Spirit. Kind of the same, but yet kind of different. And need, needing to understand what each one is. So, Those are the two extreme views. Now I want to give you the view that we're going to look at, that Peter's going to talk about really when we're here. When we talk about separation, we talk about this separated life, that trials are going to separate us. What it's going to do is when we get saved, when we get saved, and I think it goes along with what Elaine was saying. When we get saved and the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, we still have what? The old nature. But we also have a what? A new nature. We've got the old nature and we've got the new nature. One thing that you've got to get right, right, right off the bat here. You are not, what are we not doing with the old nature? What was the very first point that we looked at? We're not reforming the old nature. If you as a Christian, 
as you've come to Christ and you're trying to reform the old nature, you're looking at it wrong. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. We are not reforming the old nature. Who's trying to reform the old nature? Raise your hand. I'm raising my hand. I'm I'm trying to reform the old nature. Making my old nature better. You have a new nature. We've got a new seed that's been planted in us. The new nature of God in us, right? That is the part that is what? Eternal. That is eternity. That is, that is the incorruptible that we were talking about before. We've been looking at it wrong. We've been trying still to do what that other view said. And reform the old nature even though we're saved. You can't reform the old nature. What does the Bible say that you're to do with your old nature? Somebody's saying something. I can't hear. What did you say? Kill it! Mortify the works of the flesh. Mortify... Your flesh is as as what this morning we learned? It's like what? Grass. And he says, mortify the deeds of the flesh. Colossians chapter 3. And following down, right? Mortify the deeds of the flesh. Shelley said to kill it. And what have we been trying to do? We've been petting it. (laughs) We've been petting it. We've been trying to make it better. Haven't we? That old nature. That old person. And he says, kill it. Kill that old man. Right? And there are a few other scriptures that talk about, take up your what? Take up your cross daily and follow me. That means dying to who? Self. Self. That's the old nature, isn't it? Dying to self and letting who thrive and lead you in your life. The new nature. The Holy Spirit of God that's rejuvenated by the Word of God. I, for a long time, it took me to to actually get this piece right here that I've been working on that old nature. I've been trying to make that that old thing better. That old thing's dying. That old thing's going to pass away. But there is something new. Like I think Lee said when we were starting out, standing on the promises of God. Some of those things that we're, we're standing we're standing on him, aren't we? We are new people in him. That's what we need to be feeding. And that won't pass away. And that won't pass away. And even you know there, there's something even greater with it. The new nature, that new seed that's growing in us eternal life, that when this old thing passes away, And we are taken up to be with the Lord. What happens to this old thing? That's when it gets a new body. It It says, you know, 1 Corinthians 15 says, This old, the the corruptible will put on what? The incorruptible. This mortal will put on immortality. So we got to see this old thing. We can't try and reform it. What we need to be doing is feeding the seed that's in us. And that's the new nature. That's the new person. That's what is eternal in our lives. That's what we need to be functioning on and focusing on. Lord, help us to have that vision to see that. Because we as Christians are focusing on the wrong thing. And how do we do it? How do we do it? There's only one answer that I can give you. It's to water it. We've got to water the seed of the new nature that's in us through the Word of God. Through the Word of God. If we want to be what God has for us to be, it's right there. I think Shannon gave a pretty good illustration talking with her a little while ago this morning. And I, I'm not sure if I'm going to get it right, but I'm going to try. Uh, she was talking about, and I might have to have her help me. She was talking about anxiety. 
And she's talking about a, a particular person in reference to anxiety. And you're going to have to help me with the illustration if you can without me. You don't need to name names or anything. But the thing that I... Go ahead and share. I'm going to get a microphone to you so you can share it. Because I liked it, the way that she shared it. Well, I think I was talking about um, someone that did not have their trust in Christ and was searching for, you know, really more of a man's answer or meaning to to life and overcoming problems. And so, you know, I shared with him this view that we're talking about. It's it's a, a lot of pressure because the idea was, you know, if I make myself better and I have compassion towards others, I can keep myself happy and I can also make others around me happy. And I said, that's a lot of responsibility. That's where anxiety comes from. That you believe that it's your responsibility to, in this head, understand how to fix yourself and in turn, how to control the behavior of everyone else around you. And you will never feel settled if anyone around you is in turmoil. So the flip side of that was Christ came to this earth to show us, you know, God had to show us that there is a higher power, there is a different way, and we need a savior so that we wouldn't try to take on all of that. And that was kind of the discussion of that. One side is is breeding anxiety and fueling it. And the other side is relieving it to understand that it's not your responsibility. You need to lift yourself up to Christ and release yourself to Christ and then pray for those around you because he will do the same thing in, in the people around you. Good. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Shannon. Um, and the part that I think when she was sharing that with me is that the illustration that she gave, somebody can take on a lot of things around them, all these little things, and try and control these things in their life, and it can cause them to be what? Anxious, to have anxiety, and, and, I'm, and I'm taking it all on. Well, who wants to take all that on? Is that the old nature? That's the old nature, or maybe even somebody that hasn't been saved. They're taking all that on. So when Shannon was sharing that, she gave that illustration that the, the real beginning answer for anxiety is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's where he will begin to help with the anxiousness in our life. One was kind of a self-reformation. The other one was coming to the one that truly can make the difference. Feeding what nature? The new nature. If we begin to feed the new nature, who's anxious in here? Does anybody get anxious? If you're anxious, I ask you, how, much, how are you spending your time with the Lord? Because as we spend time feeding the new nature, feeding ourselves with the Word of God, do you know what He does in my life? I'm OCD. It's just a little different than uh, anxiety. My OCD is what person? The old nature, right? And I want to try and organize everything around me to what? Help my old nature instead of getting in to work with my brother Lee and being... <laughs> <laughs> and getting into the challenge of what? Taking yourself outside the old nature and putting yourself in the new nature because that's where real growth in our life happens, isn't it? We've been working and feeding that old, that old person when there is an answer. There is, we have psychology, we have psychologists, 
they help, don't they? So I don't, want to dis- I don't want to discredit that side of things that are there. But they should be a good Christian psychologist. Even a good Christian psychologist, if he needs to give medication to help out, he's got the, he should be working on what nature? The new nature. Not the old nature. I mean, there's some things that he may have to help out with to move us along. But we've got to be thinking, right, how the Lord wants us thinking. I could, I really, I could tell you, I could very, if I went to a psychologist, <laughs> I mean, if I went to somebody, I was kind of, for the police department, I was real reluctant to take the psychology tests. Or the, the 300, how many questions, like 300 question tests that you have to go through and you know they they have you do that so you keep answering questions and you you're going to trip yourself up because you can't remember if you're trying to if you're trying to manipulate them you're you're going to finally eventually they're going to see it so they ask you questions and i and i've mentioned this to you before that one of those questions is do you sit when you're sitting around and do you count numbers do you count to five that was one of the questions What, as I start thinking about it, what am I thinking in my mind? If I answer that, because I do. I sit here, and I'll be driving down the road, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And I don't know if anybody else does. I do that. Not to ten, not to seven, but five. Why five? I don't know. So here the que- here's the exact question on the test, right, that you're taking. Okay, and then I start thinking, in my, if I answer that, they're going to think I'm what? This guy's cuckoo, right? <laughs> this guy's crazy. So we, don't, we don't want him in here. There's something, there's something that's going on in his mind that he's doing. So you start thinking about those things, don't you? And we all, we all, you all have a few of those things, but if I went to somebody and I was to talk to them about some things right off the bat it wouldn't take them very long to say you're OCD and we need to help you out but what do I have to understand about my OCD it's the old man do I have a new man in me can that is that (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the new the new man in me should be able to lead me but i have to let him lead me right and i'm 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 getting better you can ask my wife than i used to be you know when i would come home before when I was working and stuff, she made sure that everything in the house was what? Perfect in order. Because she knew if I came in and things weren't in order, what would it do to me? Right? It, just that little thing would just move me right in, in that spot. But see, i got to understand, that's the old nature. That's the sin. That's a product of all that in my mind and in my heart, isn't it? But I've got a new nature. And he is stronger. And he's more powerful than that. And he can give the victory. Can he? So whether it's anxiety. Whether it's OCD. Whatever it might be. The little piece that you've got in your life. That you've been trying to reform that old nature. The answer is the Lord can do it. And he will do it if we understand that. Right? He will give the power and he'll give the ability in our life. But we got to be feeding him. And I like Shannon's illustration of that anxiety. Because it really just hit. The answer, the middle portion of it was, the anxiousness needed to be settled. And the only way that it was really going to begin to be settled was in Christ. Because he says to be what? To be anxious for nothing. He tells you that right out of the way. He says, be anxious for nothing. Don't be anxious. That means, if he says that, you don't have to be. Because he can give freedom in it. 
And that's pretty great, isn't it? That's pretty great. Instead of trying to help that old man, that old nature, you need to kill him. It says, the Bible says, mortify him. And it means kill him. And I'm going to end, I'm going to end with those words from Colossians, just so you don't think I'm just saying it. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, uh, I'll start in one. It says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. That is a great way to open those, those, the words out here. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid in Christ. In God, with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then ye shall also appear with him in glory. And verse 5 goes on and it says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. But I want you to just see, he talks about some sin here, doesn't he? Of the old nature. And he says to mortify it. He says to kill it. We're new. We should set our affections on who? On Christ. That's where we should be setting our affections on the Lord. And he's going to help us. He will help us. Do not try and reform. The old man, the old nature that's dying because you've got something greater. If you're a Christian here, you've got something a whole lot greater. And that's his divine nature, a new nature in you and in me. And I thank him for it. Let's pray. There's, Lee, did you have a hymn for us to end with too? Okay, Lee's got a hymn for us to end with too. So let's pray and then we'll bring Lee up. Father, we just thank you for your word.